securitization. In someone's distant algorithm, your mortgage was, bund was bundled to another's, hedged, and stamped a new security. While it was swapped from investor to investor, accruing fees and interest at each turn, your shadow partner defaulted and she abandoned her home. Someone uses your mortgage to leverage something far inside the starburst of a server? Likewise, marriage has no image. What's a mortgage and who's it engaged on the other side of the firewall? I witnessed a will which the language invested with law of godmothers the peacocks fan screech would take care of the baby in the event of a blesses herself. It lives at the cathedral and seems to be some kind of mascot for baptisms. Securities, the future art you'll make and its pleasure is hedged against the boys who died you fancied. Win-win. If an orchidophagist taste bud magnified resembles an orchid, so my buds indubitably mimic pricking ice cream cones. Love, little by little, it dawned on us the artisanal ice cream, especially the prize-winning caramel, would be out of our reach, like the previous Friday of a Sunday leaving the beach in the meltdown. When you gasp at the sound file of symbols, that knitting needle sound, through your headphones, it kindles an inkling that in the bongo playing, you can hear the wedding ring, ting, ting, in the loquescence. When you hear the sound, you may smile to think of the ones and zeros of that sound file resembling sticks and drum heads or knitting needles and drum heads as the beat gets molten. When things get molten, you may think of a fire made up of a million little match fires rendering a house on the sound belonging to ex-employers, a bit of char on the ground as the regrettable outcome of meltdown. A thousand hotheads make a Sarkozy at the sight of their BMW in a car cozy. A thousand swans make a Sigalen purring win-win. The sound is statistical, like the meltdown. The holes in your socks and the follicles in your leg are as pixelated as a JPEG. My taste buds resemble microscopic glasses of gin now. Now's the time to shake and shiver like a maraca in this house. The many kinds of dissolution. Well, birds happen forth from feeders like swinging pagodas against snow as the meltdown goes on a dump of rock salt. We'll soon be signatories by default. Crystals of sodium chloride are made of smaller crystals of sodium chloride. Let them know their house is made up of other people's houses magnified. Year round, two flags nuzzle each other in a desultory gust because they are fleeing the trees who are cruel to one another, shading their neighbors to death. A mixed bag advocating small business in a loose confederation. These flags don't give any shade at all. On the anniversary of our country, we throw dynamite at the air we build into. Daylight savings, a beeline to a sea lion as the children's song extols, or is it a beeline to a scallion? You hear your own, you hear your own accent, or a child makes an error to see if you're listening. A heartfelt counterfeit. A cough muffled in its own sputums, repeated in the next throat. A family of coughs comes to couch in us while the sun rises over the church treetops, psychops combusting all over the ground, tasked with a snowdrop. Queen Amon. Queen Amon is a French pastry that I never managed to make, so I made this poem instead. <laughs> Gotta play to your strengths. <laughs> I went to make Queen Amon. It sounded Irish and or Maghrebi, but it's Breton as I can swear by the blue hydrangea like a cloudy iris I photographed near Fenestere. 
And now I'm here in Croton on Hudson trying to remember what was sinister about the asymmetrical truths swan and signet I thought I heard listening under a sweet duvet duet. But do swans vocalize? Strengthen, strengthening the pair bond while their two pasts together caramelize the present? Sinister like Croton's name derived either from a Kichewan chief or Calabria, source of stonemasons for the dam. The former translates as Big Wind. The second is known as the birthplace of the school of Pythagoras. Sinister, not knowing if silent esoterics filter down to our little dam, dreamt of under sweet, sweet down duvets, Bretons off kilter men hears call to our bric-a-brac rock like names orphaned after the glacier's retreat from Brit Quebec to Wectiquac. The Devil's Pollard. Great angelic civic trees cropped into Ys and Vs to accommodate the power lines appear now that their leaves are sheared as the wings rather than horns of a dilemma, a diptych. It's the real politic of utilities, saying the power lines must be accommodated and therefore neither non-action is out of the question or finding solutions to aesthetic injury is too costly that the injury is more than aesthetic and may weaken the tree is thought a small but acceptable risk. And therefore we have come to the tip of one wing, we'll argue no more, the other wing, is the bard naming the devil's pollard. Gourmandizing. Shaggy rectangular cows standing and lying on green and grass. The all but abandoned stalls, the small silos, the margins of farming, what we call farming, exemplified by this Angus-filled paddock that belongs to a three-star restaurant specializing in locally grown organic food. Here were the shaggy rectangular cows with their calves in the onion grass growing great gay tendrils, the onion grass, curling horns absent from the cows which were gazing at us from their lounges as we passed on our hike, my babies cooing at their babies, tagged like fur coats with anti-theft devices. A storm dumped snow all day, packing the interglacial crevices of Westchester with ice, but our presences were requested that evening at the three-star, nay, three-supernovae su restaurant by your imperial <coughs> majesty, our lady of employment for the Christmas party, a time to eat and be merry before the axe falls. It was food for kings, robber barons. Heavily our lady moved among the tables, distributing the gift baskets. Waiters. Verily, specialists emceed the dishes that emerged with alacrity from the wings to perform their show. The table a studio for simple sacrifices of what? Sumptuously appointed watercress, oyster, and piquito, pomme de terre, angus. The storm dumped snow all day. The babysitter canceled. Driving seemed foolhardy. I risked disfavor. The ladies move. It was to be original fat. Ritual fattening in any case, and I missed it. My last meal shut in with my babies while the snow raised the ground up to the faraway sun, and now as it's dropped back again green, we're out for cost-free weekday entertainment, hiking, and come across the docile Anguses built on rectangles, landscape, not portrait, arranged delectably around the paddock in families with tufts of wild chai. Stet, stet, stet. Where the curve of the road rhymes with the reservoirs and, and cleared of the leafy veils that for six months obscured it, the lands landscape's wet chestnut in the gray descended cloud intones, you're lucky to live in a watershed, so no vast tracts of tacky drywall turn the land into peremptory enclosures. You've bought in the venial sin being exceptional, reading Herderlin, and a natural hallucinogen of joy, helium come oxygen, leaving wordy outputs hanging on piney, piney tenter hooks, while all the wild, protected liminal woods 
contrive a blind. Penny Squasher. An anamorphic octagon stretched across the wall like a penny squashed in a penny squashing machine in some rest stop on the turnpike catching your attention in some part of the brain named as an Everest or Antarctica after a fissure, a ridge, or an area. As the sun crooks through, skewing the muntins and mullions courtesy of a high ornamental window, you remember the boys asleep in car seats in Caricot, whooshed through the Nickelodeon lights of the turnpike. Awaiting you was a glass of Cabernet like a magic lantern thrown, uh, throwing across some wall of the brain its anamorphic rubiot. Boys asleep unharmed in car seat in Caricot. Reaching for the vinegar over the range hood. Now this is Gallimaufry. Reaching for the vinegar over the range hood, still dashing grass wisps on the gas flames from the exhaust vent where we booted that brooding sparrow. I remember the rabbit in the tear garden that perched on its spatula feet where the grass had just started to green. The German cl clouds were unibrow. It's not the stretching, slightly weaving that recalls it. It's the tang of vinegar. Easter egg dye solvent in my gallimaufry gets going. Guests for dinner the requisite foo for all. And the soffits of the staircase, a rag and a feather duster, in the eaves, the nests made of frass and cellophane. When it rains on a golf course, it's called Irish dew. Father-in-law's jack straw. Dundee, is this an Aussie Shiraz? Put it in the Krakow van. Cellophane and frass. Everything in the canon went into Gargantua before he was born from the ear beneath his mama's cornrows. Augustine, Aquinas, Aristotle, and Plato, Virgil, and Homer, Goliards, and Troubadours. Thus an ort peeking out from a nostril, skin flakes, a slight acne, undercoat, all colors like a pharaoh, the chuffer, snuffler, grunter, farter, pecker, whelp, head half the size of the requisition teat. Googling mastitis and finding you, ew, the whole shebang reeks of bed straw. On the radio, transrational statistics, Bridget Bardot lashing out at the leash law in Zurich. On an uncle's fourth percussive sneeze, the baby wakes in Tarabang. Maybe that's the poem your student meant when she asked if I thought they would be embarrassed someday, the children would be embarrassed someday if I... <laughs> Forgot about that. <laughs> um, I, just, I promised uh, Daisy that I would read a couple poems, at least one poem that I wrote in uh, Beirut called Blistered. So I will grab my laptop. We'll be right back. I shorted out my printer on the wrong, um, the wrong. Um, I like the voltage in the Beirut because that's the kind of person I am. <laughs> um, I'll read Seed, person in Bliss Street. Seed, slamming the broomstick butt into her eye, she was in luck. Her contact lens fell right out in her hand. Sitting down, nursing her eye, she let her son put in the disc of Sister Wendy discussing a Dutch painting with a man, a couple women, and a coin in it. The coin is the tip-off that this is a brothel. She must pause and decide whether a six-year-old boy should be watching a nun explicate a 400-year-old painting on the sale of flesh. The wind has almost threshed the window screen from the frame. We have reasoned with matter and matters conceded. We have planted a steel ball X number of tons at the top of a tower to limit its sway, which doesn't ensure for every advance there isn't something forgotten. In art I love, there is repose, not wind. There are lots of orange shirts on the playground today, under the sun, under the Landsat 7 satellite. In the office, tape is drying up. All the drawings are falling. The calendar's falling. But here's spring with surprising moistness that we're on this headland, surrounded by water. This gives us drama around the edges and a funny relation to distance. We notice the atmosphere thickening or disappearing altogether between here and the farther coast the color of pollution or rain. 
The cargo ships seem outsized, military ships detailed as a walnut engraved with the Lindisfarne gospel go on the glancing sea. I can't quite believe it. The walls are shedding our makeshift decorations, drawings, poems, postcards, as if knowing it's all destined for the cargo ships at the window. Everything foreshadows dispersal. The Save the Planet packets of quaking Aspen Sea, the Hard Rock Cafe Beirut distributed last night in the kids' menus, the flyer from school. This weekend, take time with your child to find seeds in the house and outside. We will also be taking a seed pickup walk. For this activity, please send a pair of old socks in a Ziploc bag to school with your child. Students will take off their shoes and socks and put on their old socks. They will walk in the grass and then put their old socks back in the Ziploc bags. When we get to class, we will explore our socks to see how many seeds became attached to our socks. <laughs> it's how in August, the wild carrot acquires that dried mucilage hue, umbels husking around the seed. But today, they're supple with sap, bridal white, and if the taproot is orange as sunset, we wouldn't know it. If all the pictures on the walls were bursting with seeds, we wouldn't know it. Bliss Street. From this balcony, the sight lines are clear to the rooftop volleyball court of my son's elementary school. From its mesh cage, the kids at PE class raise a right ruckus. I look over, is he up there now? No, this, his is a different period. I'm squeezing some orange halves on a cheap plastic boat with a dome like a parliament and teeth at the spout to catch seeds and pulp. Dragging a haul of juicing oranges all the way down campus in my bag, stitched with the word Cyprus. I recall the oranges were mostly on the trees in Cyprus. It was the potato we were about then, the famous Cypriot, grown in red dirt and baked in its jacket, fluffy as a buttered cloud. We would pass the fields of red dirt and in a schoolyard and wonder what it would be like to be a child raised on an island like this. Squat between sun and sea, never an ice age, abounding with indigenous flowers, evo evolving freely without extinctions. But oh yeah, massacres. Barbed wire slicing the co Nicosia in a crescent ghetto. My grandmother picked potatoes on a collective farm at the age of nine after her father died. But the funny story she told was of having shut herself inadvertently in the potato cellar while her mother was ill with pneumonia. The eldest child, she knew that if her mother died as well, it would be all on her shoulders, the infant, the other children. And already terrified to begin with, she began bawling. But you know, someone let her out after a few hours. Her mother survived the pneumonia. She survived the potato farm. Then when she was 18 and working in a hospital, her supervisor opened the pantry and gestured toward the potatoes, pocketing some in her overcoat. She's terrified all over again. If she did help herself, their boss, a kind man, would find out. If she didn't help herself, her supervisor would know she knew. She didn't take the potatoes and she didn't get fired and decades later she would return to the scene of demoralization, her version of the Stalin years. The volleyball court has gone silent. The PE teacher, whose name I don't remember, rests his arm against the ledge and overlooks the street, the campus, my building in which I sit, stuck in a thought about potatoes. He stands there a minute or two in repose, then turns and walks away, leaving the scene unpopulated as, this, as in some sketch or exercise by a painter, removed from the north to a Mediterranean Arcadia full of ruins and cypresses. Oh, it would be an exaggeration to say it's full of ruins here. More like one of those mythological scenes with youths and gods in a crowded sky. Bliss Street, overflowing with students, slowing traffic as they drift across the road. Scooters clustered outside the gate, inscribed with the motto, quote, that life may be lived more abundantly. Perfect motto for a university. Perfect as the fig trees were perfect, there grew all in one boxy wreath around the dry fountain, the kids on rent rented bicycles circled madly, that survived the Civil War by the looks of their thick trunks, ringed by apartment blocks and antenna, raised into a looming cloud the color of putty, putty not putty. I'll close with a few more poems from Shoulder Season. 
some more spring poems. Oh, I'll do this discretion. Also a landscape poem from the Northeast. Discretion. Bursey Jersey isn't quite right. A life of Hoboken after Hoboken. Your landscape is not here. I do not make a habit of losing landscapes. I accept a cup of coffee on behalf of man's prejudice against himself. Anything which is a product of his mind seems to him to be unreal or comparatively insignificant. As the landscape draws an arm in from the left but keeps its right arm flat on the horizon or draws both arms in as rows of trees close up the view like hanging sleeves. And the flatness is why Marilyn is loath until rising on a bridge, clothed in cerulean tulle. The suspension like a row of legs poised on the bar by a mirror and shedding from the jeté, a la antlers from the startled buck in the crossing sign, a metal comb, fanciful. And the shadows so sharp the tires hiccup over them like rumble strips as if shadows gel succumbing to the law of physics. There is some threshold, e.g., at which instances of hither gel into usage. And speaking of tires as full of air as thither, there is a sign, mill wheel tires right off the ramp. Coffee helps. As close as Pennsylvania to Maryland, as far as Philadelphia from Annapolis. It was while visiting, ever so briefly, one of those townhouses set like jewel boxes in the jostling street, as if Delft had never gone th that I realized my abhorrence of the housing development, for instance, the one in Kamazot's PA, where I spent some time as a kid riding a bike around a system of cul-de-sacs like a video game circa 1981, derived from a prelapsarian innocence of systems, not to mention non-standard door frames, window sizes, variable width siding, and glass that a la its moniker, slow liquid, attenuated in some sense like a tear-shaped face note toward the bottom of the pane. How to wreck revenge on a town by painting your house orange and studying it with white urinals, yes, and the coupe de grasse, a piccaninny butler with ashtray hand extended. I have a hard time comprehending how people can feel such ownership they must prove it by defacement. The silence in a room where you have recently spoken is different from any other silence, and this is evident from the sound engineer who records dead air for minutes on end after you have left. We can take consonants and vowels from all the words you've pronounced and make you say things you've never said. So the cushion of silence on which they cut and paste must have the same consistency, must be the same silence disgruntled by a helicopter. We can take consonants and vowels from all the sounds you've pronounced and make you say things you've never said. Here, one rediscovers a prejudice for oneself. And the idea that a room corresponds to a musical note and thus resonates when sung to, the idea that even this bridge might correspond to a B flat that when sung by the wind causes it to oscillate and utterly collapse, there are photographs, suggests despite the belief that we are satisfied only when we fancy ourselves surrounded by objects and laws independent of our nature. Music is material, but the material isn't wholly material. Speaking of which, construction materials are way up this year thanks to the hurricane damage in the Gulf. You mean like the wholesale destruction of cities? I am not in the habit of losing landscapes. When Ronnie asks if your family is from the other side, she has to use the phrase twice before I understand, born in Ireland. No, born here. But the other side conjures a mirror world, doesn't it? let alone the land of fairies, poetry, and mirage that we normally associate with air. I mean, take the custom of posing riddles to strangers, or choosing a question which only one person answering to an identity could know. The marriage bed hewn from a tree with its roots in the floor, or what's your mother's maiden name? On an island off the coast of Maine, a summer visitor walked into a library and asked the librarian, whom one imagines 
a woman of indeterminate middle to old age, grown into her role with its props, its pomp, its flashing bifocals. How many books can one take out at a time? Discretion. So I think I will close with the poem Squill, my spring poem. Half asleep, I heard a pin drop. The quality of light was strong. It was changing weakly. But on top of every new change was a lung-like cloud with a violet or oysterish froth burnished to pearl by an untucked ray. Sleep debt would only let me half unfurl from what I could not be prized from. At the far end of the hall, behind a door, I heard a pin drop. In another room, on the unpolyurethane wooden floor, where gaps were growing between slats, I could distinguish the sound from that of a screw. I knew it from a thumbtack. What was that dream, that brain candy cotton tube, the flight from a battalion, a mane slipping my grip, as my ear divined a button's backlight from a Lego, leaving page-worn fingertips, the Vita Nuova every night rejuvenated and dashed to bits by a baby's complaint, my oral monitoring of his lonely play syncopated with forays back into the dreamscape. From its no backstory to my daylit past in waking, to recordless and unknown history, and back again to what I knew, the sound of a dangerous small object falling from his pincer grip to the floor. I knew it from a ballpoint pen, a ballpoint pen from a felt tip. I knew the sound of his noggin hitting the floor from the rattle of a coffee mug. Jewel box, tool box, my ears spindles chimed and tattled out of dreamland, the dice in their cups, little movie screens on each side playing different scenarios. A joke, the child too quiet. What it belied was that he might choke. But I could hear what his digits dallied, and I knew he was still gambling. This is what it means to rally for the future, as my father, lambing on all floors with him, madly turned, answering the call of life, never knowing whence I came or what dirt was made flesh on my behalf. I grew the ears of a cat tough flames. I could have heard a seed growing, a seed growing in their mirroring labyrinths, twin vegetal wounds and eustachian tubes sown with squill, which when the moss is absinthe green in the brownscape is alone the smallest, simplest flower in the cold. First flower of the year, Easterish, and yet it could be a bold spy device, an earpiece. Its cells assembled from history outside my own window as the light stepped up, threw down in mystery. And though you say it is right that no one descended from Uralic language speakers has Uralic language structures, predetermining the cast of thought until badly retrofitted in English, I could not see the Siberian squill, this earpiece, Easterish, and not think of the cells of a language in my sleep growing out of the frost, assembled from history, a burned bridge as the first division from which I was lost. Thank you. sort of a new direction with your new poetry that you write off your computer. Um, what do you sense that you'll be, what tracks do you think you'll be following? What do you see that's different um, in this new work as opposed to what's, what we read in shoulder season? Um, well, you know, it's provisional. I'll work, I'll, all the first work that I do after finishing a book is kind of provisional. But I like these poems because they, 
you know, record a moment in history, you know, of, you know, this, this year in Beirut, um, memorializes it. So it is, it's pointing me in a, in one, in a certain direction, um, toward longer lines and, and, um, trying to work with narrative in, in, in disparate ways, trying to piece together, not tell one story in particular, but tell us various stories and see how they come together. Um, you know, we talked about how, like, your poems use, like, a really cool word, like, Gallimopri, or a, a cool image, like, the sign of the Tappan Dee Bridge. Can you tell me, like, maybe one image or one kind of cool, neat word that you haven't worked into a poem yet that you kind of want to? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, it's in my lap. <laughs> um, but off the top of my head, um, you know, if somebody wants to ask another question while I open my laptop, there might be something very cool here. <laughs> I just don't remember it. worked in a number of different places and for various universities. I was just kind of wondering um, what an experience it is to be both writing and teaching poetry at the same time, and if it affects your work in a different way than just when you're writing. Well, I, I think in general, having conversations with people is always a good thing for an artist. Um, you know, you don't work in a vacuum, and you, you need stimulation and in the form of other people's thoughts, you need to bounce off other people. You need to feel, you need to feel intensely about other people. So, I think that teaching is a very good way of, you know, being forced back on yourself, forced to articulate, forced to defend, for and and there's the you know affectionate aspect of it too. So it's really a good, a good thing for people in general, not just. So I, you know what I want to work into a poem? I need to work into spitting cucumber. <laughs> There's a plant that actually spits at you. And I've, um, I've been waiting to incorporate it in a poem. Um, it's not something you see in the United States, but in the Mediterranean, <coughs> it grows in the wild and it's a poisonous plant. And it looks like cucumber. So you reach down and you touch it and bang, it's, it, it leaps up at you and squirts you. So that's that's basically what I'm waiting for. A, I'm waiting for a poem to, you know, to incorporate that. Out. I don't know if that's a cool word. Yes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> um, your poems are full of sound, and I was wondering if you try to write more for sound um, over maybe the meaning. Or if you do you like read your poems aloud to see if they sound more? Well, I certainly do read poems out loud, and I think that that's um, an important thing to do. Um, I, I I think that I think that I look for meanings to emerge from sound rather than saying I would privilege sound over meaning. I would say I'm hope I'm working with sound in order to find new meanings or to to discover a meaning I wouldn't have thought of with my conscious mind. But yes, it's it's very much what I think of as, as poetry and it sets poetry apart from prose, sets it apart from ordinary speech. Can you hear me? Is it making me up? Hi, um, I'm teaching eighth grade English currently in Philadelphia and I'm struggling with the age old problem, how do I get kids interested in reading or writing poetry. Um, so if you had any advice at all on that. <laughs> well, um, you don't start them off with like Shakespeare, do you? You wrote Shakespeare yesterday. Yeah, that's your problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I would say that students have to be slowly drawn in more through things that they can relate to, poetry they can relate to, and making them write it probably helps to getting them involved. Is, do you
you do that? Ballots. We can write some ballots. Well, sometimes it, you know, if you just free them from the form and just let them work with other features other than, um, you know, set forms, mm -hmm. you know, try to get them to write more, work more with um, other aspects of poetry and how sometimes forms really turn them. where if you read it on the page, there are certain words that look alike and look cool, and then if you read it aloud, that's lost, but there's, some, there's something else where a word will sound alike, you may not have recognized reading on the page. Um, do you do you like one or the other better, or do you just intend for everyone to read aloud and read something together? I, I think it's really, well, I, I like both, I mean, but I think that I, so visually oriented myself that I and I do a lot of eye rhymes, so there is something lost in just hearing me read it out loud. Um, to me, I mean, it's just I just pack so much into it. I tend to think it's it's good to have it in front of you. And I, you know, I've enjoyed readings where um, sort of somebody giving a lecture on a poem say, "We'll pass the poem out in the audience for the audience to see it." And that would be lovely, I think, but I can't. I'm reading 20 poems and I can hand out a packet. But you know what I mean. I, I think it would be nice if, 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 if audiences could see the poems. Maybe someday I'll do a whole multimedia extravaganza with the poems behind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess one thing I noticed was that a lot of the poems seem to spring out of like eating or drinking. Like there's the one about they're eating lobster and then um, the, the family gathering and another one making like Queen, I'm not going to say correctly. Mind. Queen of mine. <laughs> or, um, you know, um, just getting a cup of coffee. Like, is that is that like um, intentional, or is it just kind of coincidence? Or, you know, it just seems like it's like a cool starting off point for. And different things happen in each of those poems, but it seems like they all have like a kind of similar like starting point with like food and drink. That's very interesting. I I didn't think of it. I nobody's ever said that to me before, <laughs> but um, I I did tend to view myself as a kind of Epicurean, not in the sense of like lighting, liking to eat and drink, although I like those things too, but in terms of uh, starting with the senses and being, you know, think of myself as being firmly grounded in the senses in general. So like paintings are very important to me. A lot of, you know, my poems start with um, a painterly sense. Either I've looked at paintings or I'm looking at a landscape and trying to think of it in a painterly fashion. So. Anything to do with um, trying to make the language as sensual as possible and, and make it a, a appeal to the eye and to the ear and even to evoke the idea of food is, is right. I mean, it's definitely picked up on that. I, I think I tend to think of, you know, I read all kinds of um, theory and philosophy and so forth, but for me, poetry is a place where the, something very abstract, which is language, intersects with our most, you know, primal experiences. In one of the poems you read to us, it begins with you, or the, the narrator, reaching over to pick up, I think it's a bottle of vinegar. Um, when a moment like that strikes you for a poem, do you stop what you're doing immediately and write it? Or is this something that you kind of store in your mind and get back to later? Well, about that. yeah, I, I, I store it and um, go back to it later. I used to write everything down obsessively, but it, it can tend to lose its magic, too, if you write it down too quickly, if you just let it sort of simmer and, and gain ramifications in your own brain. Like once you write it down, it, it's easy to just forget about it, but if you don't write it down and you, you say to yourself, I have to remember this, then other things accrue to it, too, so it becomes, you know, you've had time to marinate it. More food metaphors. <laughs> Thank you for coming, and um, please do see the the poems on the page. Uh, books are in the back, and we'll be happy to sign your books for you. So thank you very much.